This is a special episode of Tips from the Top Floor. Why TFTTF is in its teens now. This episode is brought to you by Format.com. Format makes it simple to build your fully customizable portfolio website without a single line of code. They focus on photographers like you. Simply sell your photography, send photos to your clients for proofing and update your galleries straight from Lightroom, which is, by the way, a truly magical feature. Go to Format.com slash top floor to start your free 30-day trial. That's F-O-R-M-A-T dot com slash top floor. This is Tips from the Top Floor, episode 819, the... 13th anniversary for Thursday, April the 19th, 2018. Hey, hello and welcome. This is Chris Marquardt. You're listening to Tips from the Top Floor, the longest photography show on the planet. Long, long, really long. 13 years. Yep. It is 13. It's the 13th anniversary of Tips from the Top Floor. It it, the first episode was out on April the 18th, 2005, and it is, well, the first post was out on the, April the 9th on the tfttf.com website. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll get into that later in the show. Um, the one big thing that is on my mind right now is is translation, the translation of the Wide Angle book, because I'm I'm now, in the, in the, well, I've just finished proofreading the translation there was a translation step and then a copy editing step and uh there's interesting findings <laughs> that you have when you have to go through that book again that you wrote a couple of years ago it is it's interesting well first of all i marvel at the job of a translator i could not do that i was offered to do the translation myself but Wow. I mean, the, the translator that translated my book is knows photography, um, translated books of, of photography before, but every photographer is different and every photographer's view of things is different and the subject matter is, is different depending on what you write about. It's just a really tough thing to wrap your mind around that. And, um, and that, yeah, I'm, I bow in front of the translator. Um, also, of course, it, things are not perfect. That's why there are several steps of proofreading and copy editing, and 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 uh, that's why they give me the author of a chance of uh, going over it to make sure it, it's everything is correct. And there are several s little spots where I had to clarify stuff, um, which is interesting because it really gives me a good insight into how things are perceived by someone who has not read the book before and uh, there were a few areas where I, I managed in the translation to clarify things a bit better um, when there were questions or things translated that didn't really say what I meant to say um, but yeah it, it is it is a really interesting process and I'm I'm really glad that this is kind of the way it works with going back and forth and making sure it comes out as, as polished as possible and uh, so that is now translated and proofread its next steps are for the book to go into uh, into layout and the, the, the interesting thing is well they cannot just take the German layout and use English because the same the same sentence in German might be might be a bit longer than the one in English um, it's just a difference in well, the, the sizes change, and then the layout doesn't doesn't fit a hundred percent. So there will certainly be some changes, and then I will go back over the layout to make sure that you know cer certain photos in the book need a certain size to to convey a concept well. So those sizes of pictures need to be changed, possibly, um, and so on and so on. So uh, the process will go on for a couple of more months, but I think the the pre-order is open at Amazon, and I think they still do. Uh, I think they still claim a book, uh, a, a book, a release time, a release date of some time in August. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to having that available in English. Uh, there's a pre-order link: tfttf.com slash wa book. tfttf.com slash wa b o o k. So, if you're interested in that. Um, it's fun to to do to go over my own book for a second time, and 
still discover a few things that I could have said a bit clearer. So hopefully the English version is, is going to do that. All right, 13 years of TFTTF. Hello, Chris. John Pierce here from Wolverhampton, England. I started listening to your podcast about 10 years ago. I fairly quickly went back and listened to all the prior episodes, and I'm nearly up to date now. Wonderful to uh, hear that it's been going for 13 years. Keep it going for another. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> another 13 years. Well, I'm I'm working on that. Um, for 10 years, I'm, I'd be interested how many of you out there are listeners f of the first hour of the first episode. Um, I know there's a bit of fluctuation there, but hey, th just just curious. Um, yeah, but the, the the whole thing was kicked off on tipsfromthetopfloor.com on April the 9th, 2005 with, with this post. Uh, Welcome to the Tips from the Top Floor podcast. I will use this weekly podcast to share with you my photography-related tips and tricks. A few words about myself. I'm 36 and I've been doing photography for over 18 years, four of those in the digital domain. I live in Tübingen in south southwestern Germany. I hope you enjoy the show. Please send me your feedback. You can email me at info at tips from the top floor .com or simply leave a comment on this blog. Thanks and happy shooting. Wow. History in the making. <laughs> and now the first episode came out nine days later, but that's the kind of the real birthday of the idea of the podcast and that's April the 9th, 2005. That's 156 months. I did the math. Or um, 700 and... S no, 679 weeks. So on a weekly podcast, well, we're at 819 right now. So that's well over an episode per week on average, which I'm very, very happy about. While it's not always regular, that's something to be proud of, I think. Uh, anyway, Matt... Release Pixie, Matt Refsitar Armstead, he uh, put some statistics together because he, <laughs> he has all the episodes and everything in one place and he's um, he's the keeper of, of the archive. So um, let me see, he, uh, he did some statistics, 818 episodes and approximately 106 specials over 13 years. And uh, the episode only stats, not including the specials, is uh, 93 video episodes and 725 audio episodes with a total time of 346 hours, 31 minutes and 44 seconds, which makes an average episode time of a bit over 25 minutes. And total space required to save all of those is 23.4 gigabytes. That's less than I thought. Uh, the shortest real episode was episode 310 at 3 minutes and 4 seconds, but the longest real episode was episode 621 at 1 hour and 15 50 minutes and 14 seconds. Wow. Uh, then he writes, number of times Chris touched an electric fence? One. Yeah. I think that was episode 40. <clears throat> uh, and then Matt, Matt adds, my first episode as a listener was in the late 20s or early 30s. My first episode as Release Pixie was episode 106. And I couldn't be happy happier that Matt is helping doing that because without him you wouldn't get the shows as regular it's also his job sometimes to poke me and go hey i'm gonna get a, gonna get a new episode today or this week uh so matt is definitely responsible for uh for several episodes over the last 13 years that i wouldn't have uh well that that, that i needed a little push for to get out in time um Okay, uh, everything, including a podcast, kind of needs its origin story, right? You have a, you have a legend for a founding myth, um, which I learned early because when, when I started the show, I was still working for Hewlett Packard as a project manager around like IT projects where I got to work on some cool stuff and I learned lots about the internet and the web. I, I think... I was one among the first people, well, I'm dating myself now, but I was among the first people in the company who set up a web server and who did like CGI programming, CGI, not computer graphics as it's today, but it has to do with uh, the, the, the the programming interface on old web servers. Um, I did that on a Perl backend, yep. <laughs> Perl backend, oh, good old times. Okay, um, grandpa telling war stories. Um but but this origin story thing, HP did 
did that with their HP garage, the garage here, garage there. They even did an entire advertising campaign based on that. You might remember that. Uh, and I sometimes look back to the beginnings of TFTTF and the story. <laughs> it's kind of much, much simpler. There's no garage involved, just the top floor. But um, it's pretty much my brother Peter sending me an email about the new podcast thing back then. Um, and he sent me that maybe a week before I started TFTTF. And I had the foresight to realize that that might be something worth spending time on. And also at that time, I was a very active musician and I was a producer in my spare time. At that time, I was, wasn't was only on stage a lot. I was, I was all, also kind of a one-stop shop for musicians. I did the recordings for the bands, including live tracks, uh, single uh, multi-track recordings of of the stage of live concerts but also in a kind of studio setup i did their mixing did mastering i had the the services of a cd production facility at hand to get the the cds pressed at any number requested i think the biggest run i had once was uh pressing a, a cd for a client around ten thousand pieces which was a lot for me back then and of course i offered them the photography and the graphic design for their cds so i was trying to be this uh yeah this one-stop shop so it was really quite a frenzy sometimes while like while the live recording was going on i i ran around to taking photos without losing sight of the, the like the sound levels and things while making notes of time codes to remind myself to edit in some places uh it was a busy time but it was also an amazingly rewarding time because at the end of every single project there was like this physical result that people could hold in their hands and with with hopefully beautiful pictures and hopefully good sound so for me that was a real uh a real amazing time because there was so much i was learning in such a short time and uh that's what i did on the weekends and uh, during the week i worked for hp and then i started the podcast right in time uh back in april 2005 and and looking back that was just the perfect storm i i kind of knew how to record and produce I had a topic that I, that I found really interesting and wanted to talk about. I knew my way around the internet. I could I could write write an RSS feed by hand, which I still can do today if I need to. And I had a drive to try out something new there, which I still have all the time. But back then it was like a, a ton or really a lot of new stuff coming in, and that that drive was um, was not just fueled by my curiosity which i have but it's also was also fueled by something else that had happened uh, 5 years before that and it's it's kind of a pivotal a pivot, pivotal is that the term it's an it, it's it's an important p point in time for me because i had a i had a serious burnout at work i'm not sure i've ever talked about this here in the show but back in 2000 uh i burnt out big time remember y2k if you if you were in IT back then, you definitely remember. So um, for all for all who have never heard of this, this was a bug in software, the, the weird phenomenon having to do with the with the amount of bits in in the processors and and how they store dates. So in 1999, there was that big wave of fixes and updates and system replacements and in, in, in IT and just a ton of work and I was in the middle of that I was managing systems for several clients and I was slightly out of my depth there so that whole thing stressed me out a lot more than it should have and I, I took that for about a year and then ended up getting panic attacks to the to the point where I ended up in hospital which was not fun at all it was a really bad time um but as bad of a time as it was, at the same time, it was also one of the best things that had ever happened to me. It sounds funny because a good and a bad thing at the same time, but it changed my mindset. It helped me understand what was important in life and what wasn't. And I still believe, firmly believe that without the burnout, that, that I wouldn't be talking to you right now. You wouldn't, <laughs> you wouldn't hear me talking to your eardrums at this point. So when April 2005 came, my brother told me about podcasting and, and the rest is history. Everything kind of clicked together. I threw myself into that podcast experiment and it found an audience right away, which is still amazing because, hey, I mean, seriously, who wants to listen to a German guy pontificate about apertures and shutter speeds at ISO? 
Uh, so I, I owe you guys a lot, especially those of you who were uh, were with me early and supported me in, the, in what I was doing. And I was lucky. I mean, I, I was at the right place at the right time. And a few years later, when uh, a few weeks, three weeks or months later, in the same year, Apple decided to add podcasts to the iTunes directory. And that's when the listener numbers went tenfold overnight. And then there was no no stopping this. <laughs> Especially when HP decided to lay off uh, thousands of people in Europe later that year. And I was one of them. So that was pretty much another reason for me to keep going. And and for quite, for quite a while, I made three, three TFTTF episodes per week. Uh, looking back, that was... A bit of a crazy idea, but it also helped kind of form a wonderful community around the show. And I wonder how many of you have been listeners for the, of the first hour. I really would like to know. Um, you could, you could, if you haven't sent anything in, hey, send send a voicemail. Voice at tfttf.com. There's, uh, yeah, there's space on my inbox. <laughs> and the interesting thing is that pretty much everything that has happened in my life since goes back to that very show, to Tips from the Top Floor. Uh, Tips from the Top Floor is the reason I started doing workshops. And that's mainly because of you out there, the listeners, who was who, who were asking me after a while if I was planning to do a, a workshop. So I, I remember that first email coming and saying, is there any way this... You, you, is there any possibility you might be doing a live version of that, of the podcast? And I was like... Mm. Let me try. And it wasn't my idea. It came from the community. And it, well, it opened up an entire new avenue for me uh, at that point in back in 2006. Uh, TFTTF is also the reason why I started to travel. Because without, well, I did travel before, but not in uh, in the extent that I'm doing now. And uh, without podcasting, I wouldn't have met John Miller, who took me to the first uh, Everest trek and th- without you the community this wouldn't be possible you are the ones who come on these tours with me and make, help me make this possible so TFTTF is, is is clearly one of the, of the main reason for me doing that uh, and then the, 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 the good experience I had out of TFTTF empowered me to start more podcasts to do a little podcast network and there's uh, tips on the top floor, and then there's the German happy shooting and the future of photography and curiously polar and the German gluten free podcast that I make with my with my mom um, and uh, absolute analog, which is a German film photography podcast I do with Monica. So this whole thing comes goes directly back to TFTTF, and and TFTTF is also what got me on the Tech Guy Radio Show, and I'm still there once a week, ten minutes on Sundays about photography. On, on one of America's biggest tech radio shows, which I, I don't know, I believe they have some two million listeners throughout the U.S. All, all here, doing this all here from my home in Germany, which is, is just amazing what the internet enabled and what uh, media on the internet enable. And uh, you can do these things without having to have a radio station. It's your, your own radio station. I, I find this really amazing. Even the books that I've uh, that I'm writing, I can again trace that directly back to TFTTF and the other podcasts. And now at this point in 2018, uh, podcasting has a bit of a renaissance, right? It's coming back. Uh, it's, 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 it hasn't never gone, but it's now getting some added interest. And I don't think I've ever seen uh, as many new podcasts as there are right now. And if you're thinking you want to start one, then if you have a topic you want to talk about, it's easier than ever. There are now good good and cheap microphones. Editing is easy. There are several services to help you record remote shows with other guests that are not where you are. There are podcast publishing services. Um, yeah, just do it. Find a topic, find a friend to geek out with and begin speaking into a microphone. And oh, a big thing I learned... Don't worry about how you sound. And this is, by the way, also true for those of you who submit voicemails to the show. Um, Don't worry about how you sound. I had to get used to my voice, and now I like hearing my voice. It's one of these things that 
initially it was like, whoa, but now it's like, hey, sure, that's what I sound like. And if I had worried about that too much, I would never have started TFTTF. I, and I do, I, 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 I admit, I do cringe when I listen back to the first episodes because they were way overproduced. And I, I used to cut out the ums and ahs and polish them and was trying to emulate um, a morning show radio host. Hey, how's it going? No, no, no. But <laughs> hey, it's a development. And as in photography, you can only really get better by going out and doing it repeatedly. So just do it. And it's important to show up next morning and do it again until you know what you're doing. <laughs> Oh, and, and two more things. The name tips from the top floor. That's just because I lived on the fifth floor of a building on the top floor when I started with podcasting. There's a tiny flat under the roof. So, uh, yeah, don't sweat the name of your podcast if you want to start one. Just do something, stick with it. And about the choice of topic. Why am I doing photography? Why am I not doing anything else? That wasn't 100% clear in the beginning because I had two topics that I wouldn't that I would have loved to talk about. Uh, photography and audio production, recording, mixing, mastering. And in the end, I decided for photography. I, I had the feeling that things would change dramatically. You know, this was 2005. It was just the beginning of digital photography in the mainstream. And in hindsight, I'm really glad I did that because it's just such an interesting field with really amazing developments in history and it's not stopping anytime soon. So there you have it. This episode is brought to you by WeTransfer, which is a service that I personally use all the time to share big files around the world for free. I've just done that the other day when sharing images with my publisher around the, the Wide Angle book. WeTransfer are all about making the creative process easier for everyone. There is no sign in, no offer codes, no password to forget. Just upload, send and get back to making what you make. Couldn't be easier. 40 million people use WeTransfer to send and receive files every month. And since day one, they've devoted 30% of their ad space to showcasing creative people from around the world, from musicians to illustrators, to photographers, to podcasters like me. So in that spirit, let me skip the rest of this short ad and get on with it. This show is also supported by Udemy, the largest marketplace for online learning. Whether you want to learn something new or just sharpen your skills, Udemy has an extensive library of over 65,000 courses taught by expert instructors. Ever find yourself thinking, I wish I could do that? Well, with Udemy, you can. From web development to digital marketing to, to, to Japanese cooking courses to photography, Udemy has something for everyone. While other online learning companies charge hundreds of dollars per class, Udemy courses start at just $11.99. Plus, each course comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee for risk-free learning. So there's nothing holding you back. Every day, students around the world choose Udemy to discover new passions, expand their skills, and even change careers. Improve your life through learning. Download the Udemy app to learn anytime, anywhere, or visit Udemy slash Top Floor today. That's www.ude.my slash Top Floor. That's www.ude.my slash Top Floor. And I thank them so much for their support. Hi, Chris. This is Daniel calling from Sweden. I'm a longtime listener, listening since about 2005. I just wanted to say happy anniversary. Welcome to the teens. Keep up the great work. Ciao. <laughs> Thanks so much, Daniel. Hi, Chris. This is Oli from Munich. So, tips from the top floor is going to be 13. Tough time, tough time. I have two grown-up, mostly grown-up children, 17 and 20. So, I'm completely aware of what's coming up to you. Uh, from the age between 13 to up to 17, 19. Between this age, it's called German Pubertät. So, tough time. Those children getting really, yeah difficult. Um, in Germany, we say uh, pubertät is a time when the parents get crazy so, or difficult. So let's see what's coming up. Uh, thanks a lot for your effort you're putting into this project. I really appreciate the show. I'm not completely, uh, completely regular listener. I'm in, I'm off. But overall, it's one of the best podcasts. 
it's a great mixture between uh, technology, gas, <laughs> art, information, um, great thought and mind about over, um, everything around photo photography, um, great stories about your travels, and so on and so on. So please keep on happy shooting. I uh, want to hear more from your show uh, in the future. I'm looking forward to see you. See you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks, Oli. Um, so the podcast Puberty starting right now. <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting thought. So what does puberty mean? Puberty means... Does it mean the kids get rebellious? Maybe TFTTF will become a really rebellious show in the next years. Let's see. Let's see what will come from that. Hi, Chris. This is Simon from England. I just wanted to say thank you for a great podcast and thank you also for your film photography handbook. That's been uh, a real help on my quest for analog photography. Uh, I'm just a regular amateur taking images for myself for fun and I've got a few questions in regards to scanning in 35mm and 120mm film. Uh, I have an Epson V550 which I'm using to scan my negatives in. <clears throat> and my first question is in regards to scan resolution. In your book you say that going up to 6400 dpi, which is what this V550 can do, although I think you use a, a higher model in your book, uh, but I still think the same applies, is unrealistic and isn't achievable. So I've been scanning in 35mm at 3200 dpi and my 120 at 2400 dpi. Uh, I did have some concerns over the, that being sufficient for a 35mm film, but when I've done my calculations, I think I could get a print size of about 15 inch by 10 inch at 300 dpi for my 35 mil film which is more than adequate so i just wondered if you could just please double check that and confirm that that's okay my second question is regarding okay let, let me cut you off here simon thank you so much for that <laughs> right down my alley um we'll get to the second part in a minute but first yeah um guess the the the, the 6,000 something dpi that they claim on the box are entirely unrealistic and that is true for pretty much any flatbed scanner. If you want to scan something on a flatbed scanner and they, they tell you 6,400 dpi, um, well, technically they're not lying. So that's the problem. They are not lying. The scan sensor, the, the little scan thing that's the, pretty much the same as the sensor in your digital camera, but it's just like one strip of pixels, not a surface of pixels. But that scan strip, it, it can do that high resolution. It's at that dpi, but the problem is that the... It, that, that there is an optical system between the negative and the scan sensor. There are mirrors and there are lenses and everything is housed in a in a <laughs> in a plastic housing that is subject to flex and change. That that optical system is just yeah, it's not as good. Just compare that with the price of a decent lens, and that scanner being two hundred bucks or one hundred and fifty bucks. And uh, yeah, it's just it's just hard to get this type of quality at that price level um so you said you're scanning your 35 millimeters at 3200 dpi and i believe that is already beyond the resolution that your flatbed scanner can do um it's you're creating files that are bigger without having more information in them it you're just yeah the, the resolution isn't there but uh, the files become bigger and the drawback there is of course the scanning times you scan at a higher resolution which means it takes much much longer for a single scan and uh that's that's i think it's a problem um it's also a problem that the optical resolution of these things isn't isn't uh, what their theoretical resolution is and that they advertise with that but all of them do that and there's a website filmscanner.info that has a pretty decent tests um these guys, I think, sell scanners. They do scan as a service, but they also have pretty objective tests in there with their, their resolution slides that they scan and that they use to get a, 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 an idea of, their, of the actual resolution. And it's a pretty... It, the measurements are good. I have a feeling they're really good. And uh, that's why flatbed scanners and 35mm negatives don't go together that well. Now, let me suggest an alternative approach which only has become viable in the last let's say 10 years because of the change in technology in cameras use your digital cameras to digitize your photos um here's what i do i have an led light table that's a little 25 dollar gadget it's a 
a board, a thin board. It's LED backlit, runs off USB power. I power mine with a with a simple USB power bank, and uh, can use it anywhere I want. And I use that all the time. Um, I will put a, a, an Amazon.com affiliate link in the show. You won't pay more. I get a little kickback in case you decide to get one of those. It's a thin board, and it's doesn't take much space. And all I do is I put that on a table. And then I put a macro lens on my camera and I put the camera on a tripod to look straight down onto that light table. It takes me two minutes to set this up. And uh, then the film strip goes on the light table and, and then it literally takes a couple of minutes to shoot the entire roll of film as opposed to several minutes per photo when you scan them. So the, the advantages are clear. It's much quicker. But the other advantage is the resolution is much higher than what your flatbed scanner can give you. Uh, again, realistically, with a flatbed scan, if you scan it at the re- resolution that your 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 scanner can do optically, you'll get maybe five, slightly over five megapixels out of a photo, which is plenty for printing up to decent sizes. Especially if you use the, if you see this grain structure of a fo- of a of a piece of film, those tend to to enlarge really nicely without. Uh, producing too many weird artifacts but when i use my digital camera to digitize negatives i end up with whatever resolution my camera is capable of minus a little bit of like stuff i crop off the edges so let's say i shoot at 34 megapixels i'll end up with a air quotes scan of at least 30 megapixels that is six times as much as i get from a flatbed scanner so yeah now let's let's take this a step further with 120 roll film there's a bit of a difference because look at the surface area of a 30 mil 35 millimeter photo that's like 860 square millimeters the surface area of let's say a six by nine centimeter roll film negative is 5400 square millimeters that's over six times the surface area of your 35 millimeter film. So those five megapixels you got out of your 35 millimeter uh, negative, that is now about 30 megapixels. So that's the same as with a with a decent resolution uh, camera these days. So there's no resolution difference between your camera and a flatbed scanner. However, there is still a difference in speed and a quite dramatic difference at that. Because with a higher surface area of the roll film, you will also need uh, longer scanning times. Uh, f- f- five minutes per negative is not unheard of. And that <laughs> that five minutes is about the time it takes me to set up my light table, set up my camera, put the lens on, shoot the entire roll of film. So, yeah, I prefer that. <laughs> Still with with roll film, I prefer that, even if it's a similar resolution. So again, my, my solution is to photograph pictures, the negatives, on my $25 light table using my digital camera and a macro lens. And if, if you extrapolate that up even, like 4 by 5 inch large format negatives, I always scan those on the flatbed scanner. I do not photograph them, and it has to do with the surface area again. This one is about uh, 15 times of a 35 millimeter negative. So the resolution on a flatbed scanner again is like 15 times 5 megapixels that's like 75 megapixels if you're uh if you're doing that on a flatbed scanner if you use a higher spec one let's say the epson v800 which can do optically can do about 2300 dpi according to the tests in in the real world then your scanner can get over 100 megapixels out of a large format negative which beats pretty much all non-medium format cameras at this point Okay, on to your second question. My second question is regards to the file type, TIFF file or JPEG. Now, I understand JPEG is a a file that does lose some quality compared to a TIFF file, but the difference in file sizes are massive, 23 meg versus about 160 uh, meg. So I was just wondering whether it is actually worth it and wondered if you could elaborate a little further. In particular, I've been saving the JPEGs at the high quality level, um, which I think is a, is a level one compression. So it has very little losses to it. I've also seen some people mention about um, 
saving as a JPEG and then converting it to a TIFF in Photoshop and doing your edits there and then saving back as a JPEG. I wondered if there's any truth in that or whether to save as a TIFF file and then do your edits, then save as a JPEG for your storage and then delete the TIFF file that's, that's uh, huge. So I just wondered if you could elaborate a little further on that and that would be of great help. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Simon, don't do JPEG for editing or scanning. Um, yeah, I know the file sizes are different. And even if you set the JPEG to its highest quality level, which means little or no compression, um, you are still in a format that isn't up to par for what you're trying to do. By all means, save as a TIFF. Scan directly to TIFF and high bit rate TIFF. So if you scan in color, scan to 48 bits, 3 times 16 or if you're doing black and white, set save to 16-bit black and white. JPEG is lossy, and you should always work with the best that you can get. Uh, it's it's not JPEG is not meant to be edited. It's inferior in almost any other aspect than the size. Um, and uh, the most important probably is JPEG is an 8-bit format, which means each color channel if you, of your photo has only 8 bits of brightness resolution. That's that's, that's the amount of shades of, of, of that color. That's 256, 256 shades of blue, 256 shades of red, and 256 shades of green. That's all there is in a JPEG. And while they might look just fine to you, if you edit them, you will, you, will, you will run into issues. The first thing to fall victim to this kind of reduction in shades is stuff like Let's say the blue sky, for example. Very good example. Uh, easy to reproduce. Because the blue sky is a fine gradient of blue. And the moment you change that, the moment you go and, uh, I don't know, change the contrasts in that, you will get stair-stepping. You will get banding. So-called banding. B-A-N-D-I-N-G. Google that. Um, those edits can easily kill that if with only 256 shades of different color channels. TIFF, in contrast, if you use the high bit resolution that can carry 16 bits per color channel that's over 65,000 shades in each color channel and you will need that especially if you want to do any edits afterwards like changing the contrast or doing color corrections and uh, yes i agree tiffs are bigger <laughs> tiffs are a lot bigger um, you can you can have some internal TIFF compression. There's like a zip and other diff, different kinds of compressions that usually work just fine. So you can reduce the size a bit as opposed to non-compressed or uncompressed TIFFs, and that's not lossy. So you can you can easily use that, and the software won't see any degradation. Um, but the disk space is so cheap these days. Um, I, I just looked up a uh, four terabyte external disk is ninety nine dollars. And that will hold if if you even if your pictures are two hundred megabits e megabytes each, if the, which they aren't. But let's just assume you're getting a higher resolution some way. Then that four terabyte disk will hold twenty thousand scans of two hundred megabytes each. That is over five hundred rolls of film. And that is only if you scan each photo at that high resolution. That's a lot. I don't usually do this. I pick and match photos and and uh, only only scan a portion of my photos at that high resolution. So my suggestion is upgrade your storage. Don't worry about the file sizes. Seriously, don't. Um, also, <laughs> converting stuff back and forth between JPEG and TIFF, and JPEG, don't do that. It's not going to help. It's, it's going to make things worse. And but by the way, <laughs> a great exercise, a really great exercise... Uh, if you're afraid of the files, as would be to begin shooting video, where you will deal with files of several gigabytes sometimes. That will give you the right perspective when it comes to file sizes of TIFF files. All right, and that was it for this anniversary episode of Tips from the Top Floor. Hey, thank you guys for yeah for being around for 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 supporting the show. There are several different ways that you can help keep Tips from the Top Floor going. Go to tfttf.com/support for more information. And of course, thanks so much to Format.com, WeTransfer, and Udemy for supporting this episode of Tips from the Top Floor. 
And don't forget to send in your voicemails, e even belated wishes for the anniversary. I'll take everything. I love getting your questions and your feedback and your tips and anecdotes. You know the drill, record on your smartphone, send to voice at tfttf.com. That's voice at tfttf.com. Music for the show by Jeff Smith, Silent Partner, Hans Peter Kagrut Publishing, and Slack Challenges by Release Pixie, Matt Rasseter Armstead, and Slack Invitations by Chief Invitation Officer, CIO Rusty Russ. I remember that. My name is Chris Marquardt. Follow me on social media at Chris Marquardt, Chris M A R Q U A R D T. And of course, go out and take amazing photos. Be nice to each other. And happy shooting. <laughs>